so my talk uh, will be hopefully short, and then we'll go on to two exploration plays, one uh, that's uh, working on a copper gold porphyry system in Mexico, uh, which is Azúcar Minerals, which just put out a news release recently. And uh, then we'll go on to Mindoro Capital, who are working a prospect generator in the Tethian belt uh, of Serbia, where we've seen a lot of news recently with with the uh, reacquisition of Timok uh, by, uh, by a Chinese entity, as well as the same one that bought RTB Bohr. So that's sort of heating up now. Okay, so my talk is really about last week. Uh, so it's almost like um, that Oliver guy last week tonight. So basically I'm gonna go over what I gleaned out of the Precious Metal Conference last week. So here we go. So we'll talk about the Precious Metal Summit. So for some of you that don't know it, we'll just try to explain how this little conference is a little conference that could and is now almost as big uh, by attendees as, as the Denver Gold Show. Uh, then we'll talk about um, an investor panel I moderated with uh, a good dissection of uh, institutional equity, private equity, as well as retail. And then we'll just conclude. Okay, so, so the the Denver Gold, uh, sorry, the Beaver Creek uh, Precious Metal Summit uh, is is in its eighth year, and it's been growing. Uh, and as you can see here, just this year it peaked over a thousand, and that's not very much different than its bigger brother that handles the the bigger companies uh, down in uh, down in uh, Denver and in uh, Colorado Springs. So now it's peaked over a thousand. And so what's been happening is basically this, this thing has been sponsored by banks, brokerage firms, companies, media outlets, but basically the focus has always been, because the person running this for the last eight years was the same person who ran the gold show. Uh, she saw an opportunity that in the gold show, little companies didn't get the kind of time that big companies did. So she made a presentation to get institutional equity in front of these small companies, strategically placed it, timed it right before the gold show, put it in a place in Beaver Creek, in Vail, beautiful spot, uh, but also someplace nobody could leave. <laughs> so you, it's not like you can go there and then go to a dinner somewhere else and then meet people and do something else. You always consistently met people wherever you went. And so the amount of one-on-ones that uh, this, uh, uh, conference uh, actually generates is, is huge. Like when I was there, they, they, they had another tent to handle all the one-on-ones uh, that they had to, that, that, that were generated. Like the, the two biggest components remain the institutional equity uh, and the, uh, the companies that, uh, that sponsor it, but also an increasingly conspicuous group has been corporate development of everybody. So it, it, even though it says precious metals, you get gold, silver companies, but you get copper companies. You get uh, juniors that are doing lithium. You get zinc companies all hanging around there because they couldn't get in. So the waiting list for this thing is ridiculous. And if you can get in, it's sort of like saying you'll drop everything to be there. So again, the whole point is that this is a very important conference for companies institutional equity, but now also corporate development with respect to uh, potential M&A activity. Oh, sorry, wrong button. Okay, so this, this uh, keynote investor panel, they always do um, uh, a um, keynote. I never go to them because they're usually pretty boring. So what they did was they made me do it so that I had to show up. Uh, so, so I went, uh, and what was interesting about it, what it was attractive to me was uh, you got a good break between institutional equity, private equity, uh, sorry, I should be pointing, but uh, so institutional equity, private equity, uh, retail, and yours truly. Uh, and, and so um, in terms of who's buying, what are they thinking? And so we got a really good sort of perspective on that. And so what I'm gonna do is just relay that to you that my subscribers have already read from last week's letter. So first we get Joe Foster. Joe Foster is like uh, an icon right now in the uh, institutional equity side, Van Eck portfolio manager. 
uh, based out of uh, uh, New York. So this guy's a geologist, that guy's a geologist, this guy's a geologist, that guy's an engineer. So all pretty technical guys. Okay, and so he's been a geologist and he's been working at Van Eck for a while now. So Van Eck is a growth fund, 58 holdings, right now assets under management by um, oh, just over 500 million. Underweight the majors, overweight mid-tiers and development. So development meaning things like Sabina, that sort of level, okay? That's what he's into. So the discussion points with him was, you know, where gold is, and so when he talks to his clientele, they're negative. They think gold stocks are a value trap. There's no reason for me to buy them because that's just destroying my, my money. And so the issue is that you've got a strong U.S. economy, you've got equity markets at highs, and these guys thinking it's going to go even higher, potentially because of the tax breaks. Low inflation rates, so no worries about that right now. Low volatility, so there's very much more on that CNN money guide between the greed and the fear index. Greed is much more than fear right now. And the big thing for him is the lack of systemic risk. And for systemic risk is inherent in the market. It's, it's, a, it's a market risk that you cannot diversify away from. And the lack of ability to diversify away for it pushes people to invest in things like safe haven assets like gold. The lack of a systemic risk right now prevents people from generalists from investing in gold. The other issue in terms of a holding cost for gold is the increase in uh, interest rates. So, so the issue right now is that what he's seeing, and this is his uh, discussion more so than mine, is that he saw this capitulation in the early 2000s. So what he's seeing right now is potentially and maybe he's saying that because he's a portfolio manager of one of the bigger funds and he needs people to invest in his fund, but he's thinking that right now in the short term, we could still be doing this. But right now, we may be in the late stages of the capitulation. Like, on a volatility basis, absolutely this, on an absolute volatility basis, this looks much bigger than what happened here, but on a percent, if you normalize this by taking the standard deviation of that over the, uh, the mean, this range, bound uh, scenario here, is the same as that. Because when gold prices are low, any price is low. The volatility in terms of absolute is a lot less. Higher prices, higher volatility on an absolute basis. Okay, so next. So as we were talking, you know, he said that I'm underweight majors. And so, you know, so why? Well, majors, like he's a growth guy, so majors have problems with growth. Four to five million ounces, and, I've, and I think I might have said this before, it's hard to grow. It's hard to find accretive assets that you can actually put into your portfolio and grow consistently on a five to 10% compound annual growth rate. Um, the big direction he would push on these guys, and he has probably, is to say lower your costs, Improve yields, meaning dividends. That's why he likes Newmont, because their yields are basically uh, attached to the gold price. Higher gold price, you give me more dividend, which imposes a capital constraint on the company and some discipline. Um, and geopolitical concern is huge for him. There are some places he will not go. So then, as we were talking, which was the week before, then this Monday, we get Barrick Gold announcing their big acquisition, $6 billion, no premium, uh, for Rand Gold. So this is the largest acquisition uh, for Barrick since the acquisition of Equinox, sorry, for Lumwana Copper Asset in Zambia, Zambia for $7.3 billion in 2011, which, if some of you are not aware, did not turn out very well. Okay, uh, the whole objective with Rand Gold was, if you've read the Globe and Mail, I think it was a couple of weeks ago with the interview from the chairman, um, uh, John Thornton, was about not necessarily growing production for Barrick, but generating more free cash flow. He was all about growing free cash flow, which does not necessarily translate to growing ounces because he wants to squeeze more cash out of each asset. So there's really no point in adding an ounce when it gets me a negative dollar. And when I worked for Newmont, it was all about ounces, but that was in the uh, mid-2000s. Uh, 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 Thornton is pushing a completely different philosophy, 
which has not attracted very many investors this year. They have been one of the worst performing major gold companies uh, in the first uh, part of the year, year to date. So what, he, what this is, is basically adding more tier one assets. So, you know, I, I, I had Cortez, got, uh, uh, I've got Pueblo Viejo, but now I get Kibale, I've already got Gold Strike, so I'm adding Lulu, so I'm adding more of these tier one assets, which I cannot find anywhere else. And I'm, and I'm buying it at no premium. And then effectively, I'm lowering my group cash cost. I'm increasing my margin, hopefully my profitability. But this comes at a cost. The cost is the risk, the geopolitical risk. Before you got out, meaning Barrick, out of Africa, you know, good book, um, because of your exposures. And then you created Acacia and just lumped it all there. Now you're going back into Africa, big time. Places like the DRC, Places like Senegal, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, so that might be negative for some of their shareholders. But if they're all interested in dividends, free cash flow, some generalists it may appeal to. But the other thing that he's trying to do, and I'm not advocating for him, but um, is deepening partnerships with Chinese companies like Shandong. So they did a swap of 300 million. I'll invest in you, you invest in me. We're brothers, we're gonna ride this out. So the whole idea here is in terms of influence in Africa, there is no country that's got more influence in Africa than China. In terms of the money they spent there, the infrastructure they put in place, the deals they're already making, having them on your side when you take this much geopolitical risk exposure in Africa is smart. The other thing is that they were talking about in this 90 odd page document that they put out that they might move their office to Vancouver. Um, so, interesting, considering Rand Gold's, I believe, in London and listed there, uh, as well as in New York, and uh, Barrick's office, obviously, in Toronto. One thing I've always noticed when I work for big companies is the easiest way to get rid of people is move the company. <laughs> so. Okay. So, the other thing about Van Eck, which is really important, is that even, uh, um, Joe Foster is in charge of the active investment fund. He's not in charge of the passive fund. And passive versus active is a huge thing. So the precious metal sector, this was by a CIBC report uh, a month or so ago, was the assets under management in terms of uh, active uh, in terms of total, active and passive was about 53 billion in 2011. Okay, well over 90%, 93, 94% was actively managed. And the difference is actively managed, these are the guys that do private placements, these are the guys that meet in Beaver Creek, these are the guys that raise money for you, these are the guys that back you in terms of companies. Um, you know, they wine and dine you, a lot of parties, all that sort of stuff. $400 cigars. So these are the guys doing that. $54 billion, 2011, 50 billion of that probably was actively managed. Now, that pie is around 35 billion. But importantly, for, for companies, and we've seen this before, is that that institutional equity active component has been reduced by 80%. So that 50 has gone to 10. And so there's a lot less money that they have to deal with. So, so they, they can't make all the investments that they wanted to before. Um, a lot of people can't bother them anymore because these guys are being uh, experiencing active redemptions. So a smaller assets under management pie, you know, due to valuations, but also a smaller slice for the active guys. So, so Joe Foster gave us these numbers, which I wrote down. So right now, just in North America, there's 18 active funds just like him um, that now control about eight and a half billion. So over the past three years, they've dropped by about a billion, but recently, just year to date, most of that, 55% of that billion, actually came out this year in terms of redemptions. Whereas the passive funds, there's less of them, the biggest by far, is Van X, GDX, and GDXJ. Uh, I think they're 80%. They're currently 14 billion, just US-based. 
they've added 7.2 billion in the last three years, less than half year to date. So all that money, more money is coming in to passive funds than is actually leaving active. So saying that people are interested in the sector, but the way they want to play it is different. And so the generalists that are coming in thinking, here's something I can play, but how I want to play it is different than how you used to play it. So I don't want you stock picking for me. I want a liquid index. I want anonymity. I want trading flexibility. And what does that mean? I want options. I want to be able to buy options. I want to be able to do a call. I want to do a put. I want to be able to short things. So all that flexibility comes with anonymity and gives me liquidity. And so the generalists prefer that. And so the active funds have suffered. And in turn, companies have suffered. OK, so now we move to private equity. And so this is uh, Josh Perrell, uh, uh, investment team leader with Resource Capital Funds. Uh, now this fund is like multi-billion dollars, different funds, 174 mining companies. They're not only gold, 30 commodities in 51 countries. When I did my master's of mineral economics at uh, the Colorado School of Mines in Denver, I interned for these guys. There was about five guys there, uh, not the hamburger place. Uh, and now there's a, easily over 100, global. Uh, they've got a guy in Santiago in Chile. They've always had an office in Australia. They're all over the place. Uh, so much bigger right now. So it's just the impact of private equity right now. So private equity right now, like I said, uh, firms like RCF, long-term investment cycle, they don't have the... They don't deal with the kind of redemption cycle some of these uh, institutional equity guys do. They can afford to be longer term. They can afford to be commodity agnostic. Uh, you know, and they're, they're right now invested, like I said, in over 30 com uh, commodities. And they're directed by their, uh, now they have a chief commodity strategist who basically says, these are the exposures we want. Their preference right now, no order, copper, gold, zinc, and nickel. What I did was I just graphed some of the ones they have, the ETFs, how they've done. So zinc, one of the worst performers. Lithium, which is the one we like, but nickel's also positive, gold. And then you can see XBM, lithium here, and GDXJ in terms of proxies for ETFs for the, for the commodities. All of them have not performed very well. And so where does private equity help us as, as equity holders of juniors or you know, companies as a whole? So the traditional focus with private equity has been like when I interned for them to write big checks like converts, convertible debentures that require intense due diligence. So their whole idea was that we're beyond a resource. We have a feasibility study that we can work with. You know? So we're past the exploration risk. We're now focused on the technical risk, the execution risk, and all that. Something we can handle and we can discuss with them and mitigate, because we've got technical people. So the, the PE firms now are offering this one-stop shop for mining companies. They'll do debt, they'll do equity, they'll do streams. They don't need banks. They don't need uh, brokerage firms. They don't need anybody. You know, for example, like we looked at the uh, financials for um, Pretium's $350 million credit facility with Orion Mine Finance and Blackstone Tactical Opportunities, another private equity group. Um, the cost of capital for just that 350, and this is Pretium's number, not mine, was 15%. So it's a one-stop shop, but it's not cheap, just like a 7-Eleven. You know, it's not the place you would go to to buy a lot of stuff. It's just a convenience store. So, but convenience comes at a cost. So the other thing about RCF is to capture some of the upside of exploration is, is to look at, um, is look at creating another fund that takes more risk. And they've created another fund where they could actually deploy three to five million. This fund is slowly being developed over the last year, year and a half. And they could do high risk. 
but the risk is in expiration, and they're okay with that. They'll diversify, they'll buy a lot of little placements. They write smaller checks and take bigger risks, but it's more nimble. So that's been something that's pervading the market over the last year and a half. And so the other component about private equity that impacts us on the junior side is taking things private. So we saw that with Dalradian. Uh, uh, it was uh, Orion Mine Finance again that took them out at about a buck 47. 60% premium, great for shareholders at the time, but it was the same price that they offered about six months ago or nine months ago in October of the year before when they bought $80 million worth of shares with a Cisco. So in the interim, Dalradian issued a 30% or 46% increase in the resource. Their stock went down because everyone knew they had to raise. Uh, and so these guys just got tired of the market. They thought that they could get more value by taking it out of the market and just doing it privately. The valuation is comparable to what we're seeing in the market, $65 per ounce of global resource, with, which is what that ended up being. But the whole idea with the, the you got a private equity company, no experience in mining, permitting, building, operating a gold mine, and is purchasing this asset. Uh, the experienced private equity firms is mixed, to put it kindly, in terms of developing assets on their own, so let's see how they do. But in terms of us as equity holders, we don't care, because hopefully we got that 60% premium. We got another suitor out there uh, that potentially will take out some of these uh, development plays or exploration plays. So that, that's a positive for us in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of suitors. So the other thing that we noticed uh, while we were there was the, the Australians. So uh, over the summer, I did head to Australia, and I went to the Noosa Mining Conference. I presented there. And uh, they got 800 plus people, um, high net worth retail um, in the Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast of uh, Queensland. Uh, all ASX companies, juniors, uh, and they, they time it well because Australia's tax year ends in the end of June and they do it right in July. So everyone's sold everything and now they're looking to replenish. And uh, it was a very good conference. But what we're seeing right now is these companies have done really well because of the weak Australian dollar has converted to a strong Australian dollar gold price. And, and if you meet any Australian companies, ASX listed, especially the management team will push to go to production. And you think, whoa, 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 but they do it. And what that, what's that driven in the last five plus years is all these companies becoming mid-tier producers as they consolidate. As big companies get rid of assets, these guys pick them up. They operate them differently, save money. Now they've got better balance sheets, strong valuations. And the other problem is where they are. Like companies like Newcrest always touted, oh, hey, I'm in Asia. Nobody else is here. This is my own background, uh, backyard. Uh, I can operate here as much as I want. But the problem is now the increasing geopolitical risk in Asia in, in, in places that are well endowed metallogenically, like, like Indonesia, the Philippines, ha are forcing these guys to go somewhere else. And where they're coming is the Americas. Um, and uh, now we have another serious suit of companies coming over here acquiring assets. And we could point to, uh, 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 to Morgan's company here with Asuka, and he'll discuss that with Newcrest's private placement in that company. And so you can see that when you look at the, this graphic about placements, commitments, uh, in terms of purchases. Like some of the big ones here are Newcrest, South 32. A Newcrest is um, like they're in Ecuador now. They're in Mexico with Morgan. Um, they're also in, uh, in Chile with Mirasol. South 32 made two big bets on zinc in uh, Nevada. Oh, sorry, in Arizona, and in copper in Alaska, and also Oceana Gold here. So now, and now we see Northern Star actually purchase an asset outright, Pogo, the underground project operated by Sumitomo. Again, that purchase price was about 65 bucks an ounce. So we're seeing these guys getting more active. It's been happening. It's not like it just happened yesterday. It's been happening over the last year and a bit. But you could really see it when you looked at the attendance of Beaver Creek and also the Denver Gold Show. The contingents of Australians is huge. Okay, lastly, we'll go to retail. 
Steve Todorek, investment executive from Spark Global. He handles about 100 million ish. Focus on discovery, commodity agnostic, not unlike ourselves. So what I did was I graphed that same graphic some of you saw a couple of presentations ago. So about 25 companies, price to peak announcement, prior to announcement, what they did when they announced a drilling result or something. So out of these 25 companies averaging about 550% return. And that's basically what everyone's looking for, that number. Hopefully this one, not that one, but that sort of number. So that's why you do this. Problematically, this is a high risk game. So the two months that you could gain 550%, you could lose 97% in the next 10. So expiration, obviously very good when it's good and bad when it's bad. Uh, and that's the game we play. What we try to do at Exploration Insights is leave the risk in the drill bit. So if it's geopolitical, execution, technical, management team, problems with capital structure, uh, we, we would be less keen. But if it's on the drill bit, that's a risk we're willing to take because that's why we're in it. So, you know, not to downplay this, but, but uh, so an industry icon like Mr. Eric Sprott, and this is not the return that Mr. Sprott would make. This is just a return if you followed him. So if you followed him from being an insider and to where something's trading right now or to when he sold, what would you have made? So all I'm saying is that that same graphic, and I'll show you that, you know, everyone's the same. But I mean, we don't see a lot of this being talked about. What we see is this being talked about. Okay, everybody's the same. We take a lot of risk, okay? And I'm not sure if more of this was invested in this and less in this, so this is not a weighted average and reflection of his absolute return because he has also got warrants and other things. All I'm depicting is what if you followed him. Okay. So lastly, us. So year to date, 22 companies, if you took those 22 companies, when we bought them, when we sold them, if we sold them, or what they're doing right now, we've only done 3%. And then you get this huge range between the stuff that didn't work out, minus 76%, to the stuff that worked out, 450%. Our 32 open positions right now, average returns about 50%. 18 companies, but they can go all the way from negative 80% to over 1,000, and that's expiration. Benchmark, slightly better, 60%. The closed positions this year, 226%. But again, that's a range of down 86, up over 1,000. So I don't see this changing very much for expiration going forward. All we try to do is make sure that risk that we take is on the drill bit and not because of something else. Okay, I'm gonna run really quickly through my conclusions. So the big takeaway from Joe Foster would be the tail end of a protracted capitulation. Look at that, compare that to 2000, do your own work. But a, a definite phenomenon is the growth of ETFs. That's not just in gold equities, that's in everything. Gold is just another sector that's seeing that. Private equity is another potential suitor for your companies. Uh, fickle markets, market value dis uh, dislocations can be had by private equity as well as Australian miners coming over. And again, expiration, high risk, high reward. You can make a lot of money in two months and you could lose a lot in 10. Okay, thank you very much.